All right. Um, welcome, everyone. Um, very nice to have you guys here uh, with us this evening. Uh, for you who are new to the Women in Tech Sri Lanka meetups, this is a network for women across the country um, who is working within tech and wants to build their network, get some insight and um, uh, information about how to build a career in this industry and just get inspired from, from other female um, engineers in the, uh, in the field. Um, before we get started with today's session, uh, I just want to be, uh, give a big shout out to Hansa Mali Gamage and Fikri Ismail for organizing this event and getting this really impressive speaker and panel lineup uh, on board. So um, big shout out to you guys for uh, putting your effort into this, this event. Um, and me, who are uh, moderating this event today. Uh, my name is Anna Kalm. I'm the founder and CEO of the software company slash spaceship that we call Ascentic. Um, I am originally from Sweden. Um, from For the last four years, I've been living here in Colombo, Sri Lanka, and um, building this uh, company, Ascentic. Um, I'm really honored to be a part of this uh, important initiative. Uh, I believe uh, highlighting role models uh, and mentoring uh, is a really vital part of the of, of simply uh, creating uh, more equal opportunities and seeing a shift in in gender balance in this industry. So I'm really happy to be a, a part of this today. Um, in, to, in today's session, um, we have uh, two uh, speakers who will be giving their, um, sharing their journeys uh, and thoughts. And uh, then we will end with a panel discussion where we have um, three additional um, um, females from the industry who will be uh, sharing their thoughts on some different topics. Um, throughout the session, uh, you can uh, post questions that you have either through the, the chat, uh, that, uh, through the, the medium that you're uh, entering this, this session in. Um, you can also use the Slido link uh, that has been posted in the, in the uh, event information as well. Um, so don't hesitate to ask your question and in the end we will be directing them to the to the panel. So with that, uh, without further ado, I want to introduce you to the first speaker for tonight. So uh, Ange Serbolis, uh, she is an application analyst in Singapore. She focuses on Microsoft 365 and Power Platform. She's a Microsoft MVP. Uh, curious about how things work, especially within tech. Um, she's a big fan of earning and connecting during her free time. She loves to read books, uh, watch anime, uh, write blogs and explore new, new things, um, which we I think we'll hear more about in her session here today. So I'm really eager to hear uh, about your journey. Please take the stage, Ange. Thanks, Anna. Uh, let me try to show my screen. Mm. Okay, let me know if you could see my screen now. Okay, I just want to confirm if you can see the screen. Okay. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, um, Anna, and also for Hansa and Fikri to to organize this um, great uh, uh, event. So for today, I'm going to discuss about my journey with technology and also my learnings, uh, uh, my learnings and perspective. Um, disclaimer: everything that you've heard from me or you see here is only based on my own uh, perspective only. So it doesn't affect other, I mean, it doesn't, uh, um, yeah, so it's all personal. And also my learnings as well. So, um, okay, so, so hi, I'm Mary Angela Serbales. As Anna said, I'm also an application analyst. And you can find me on Twitter and link it by scanning the code, uh, the QR code below, or just type it or find me on Twitter uh, or search me at LinkedIn. So 
today I'm going to share the five lessons that I learned throughout my journey in the technology. So what I have is don't be afraid to make mistakes. So does any one of you have this experience in the classroom settings where you know the answer but are afraid to raise your hands or want to see how the teacher comes up with a solution but afraid to ask? And then after after the teacher um, uh, finished with his lessons and then afterwards you have this regret word flustered in your calendar because you didn't do it. And then because you're uh, because we're afraid of making mistakes and everyone will laugh at you. And then when I was in grade school, if I could uh, grade school or until high school, I was scared to make mistakes. So I was one of the students that if I know the answer or have a question, I tend not to raise my hand at all because I'm afraid to get judged or laugh about. And then, and then I remember when, when that time I experienced it, experience it and uh, I tend to answer a question when one of my teacher um, asks a question, they laugh so hard because I answer it wrongly. And then that's, that's the time that I feel like I want that I wish that the floor were open and swallowed me because of um, I'm already ashamed of what I've done, which is I just answered the, uh, the questions wrongly. So and that's the reason why it makes me hesitant sometimes to speak out. And then other than that, I'm not good conversa uh, conversationalist. So in short, I'm an introvert as well. And then I think my first failure when I reach college, like you don't know what to do and you're afraid to say, like, um, I think one of the subjects I failed and then like, you don't know what to do if, cause you're afraid to say to your parents because you failed and then you don't have a choice because sooner or later they will know. So you need to tell them at the end of the day. So I told them they get angry, but they still accepted it. So. The feeling of failure is sometimes devastating, or it is devastating at times. But if you look at the bright side, you've learned something. And you know that feeling when you experience something new for the first time, and then you share it again in a few months or years, you already know what to do. And then you get used to it, and then you gain new learning. So that feeling of learning new things makes uh, make, it makes uh, it. it um, it excites you. So you fail, you learn, and then you've, lear uh, you've learned something new. So what I'm saying is we are afraid to make mistakes, but mistakes makes us grow and our best teacher in life. So we know that some, sometimes accepting failure is hard, also in the society as a woman. So everyone thinks we should be perfect. So we are always looking and we are always looking for an environment where people will not laugh at you if you make mistakes or accept who you are and willing to help you is a hard uh, is a place um, that hardest to find and so this leads me to find an ally or support group so after I graduated from college. I took an adventure to work in Manila, Philippines. So my Manila is not my hometown. So I work here in Singapore, but um, I came from Philippines. So wh uh, what I did after I graduated, so we bought a one-way ticket to Manila and start the job hunting. So after a few days and months of looking, I get accepted. And then I remember one of my manager asked me if I know SharePoint, Microsoft SharePoint. And honestly, I don't know about SharePoint at all. So I started being in the community when I began to learn um, the Microsoft SharePoint as an anonymous person in the community. So the resources that I have are limited. So you have to be unknown to ask questions online because some people either will help you or insult you because you don't know or not at all or you don't know at all so what i did is i just only read read many articles bookmark all the mvps that are sh that shares uh, great articles and best practices and join some online conference and meetups so 
like after a few meetups that I joined that I attended in Manila, I noticed like 30 attendees, like only two to four out women. And then I started and then I get curious and started to, to explore if there's a community for women. For women and that's where i found about the women who code so women who code is a non-organizational um, community in uh, us so what i did is because manila doesn't have one at that time so so i applied to bring women who code to manila what i love about women who code because it's not all about coding it's not only focusing in one programming language when you do some sessions or some, something like that, but it's all about technology and mentoring. So it's a place or an environment where women can be comfortable, no judgment, no bias, and helping one another. So that's the reason why I bring it to Manila. So that's me in this area where I, I do this always. So that's the first, um, so, so that's the, launch of women who code like back in 20 um january 2020 2017 so that was four years ago so i was so scared about it because i don't know what to do it's my first time to be uh, surrounded by by inspiring women and you don't know what to do but at least you get to enjoy what you're going to do and then and i think currently uh Previous, so the the launch was like only eleven of us as a member, or who attend our sessions. But then, as uh, right now, I think there are more than two thousand plus or more members, and it's still growing. So, because I stepped down as a director in Women Who Code due to a career shift leading me here to Singapore, but I still support them and 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 I'm happy where they are at now and. Also, sometimes I join, I join some events here in Women Who Code Singapore and meet great people here. So because of this connection and um, has broadened me and I learned a lot in the community. So it inspires you a lot and it motivates you to keep going. So the community keeps me going to share what I have right now and I feel at home. Also, this journey is not about women. We need also to find an ally that can support us. So it's not about isolation or also this journey. Is, um, we need also to find like, who are you going, who is the person that will bring us, uh, will bring out in you. So you need to find mentors, not only women, but also men to help you to go on with your journey. So, and uh, because also I'm, I'm part of the Microsoft Humans of, IT, uh, Humans of IT Ambassadors, I'm one of them. So if you want to join, just join this link because we discussed that Humans of IT is not all about technology. It's not about what's new on the, the, uh, in, the uh, in, in the tech uh, in the technology, but we discuss about mental health, ment mentoring, and how technology could help us solve issue. And also, so after you find your ally or, or the community that, uh, that you want to be, also don't stop, uh, don't stop, always keep learning and also um, share what you have. So like, Learning is a never-ending journey for us. So we may think that what we know, uh, what we know already, is sometimes. Um, so we think we know it already, but it's not. So everything is evolving, evolving so fast. Sometimes you can't keep up, especially when it comes to technology. So previously, resources have been limited, like books, blogs, and documentation. Right now, you have everywhere. So you have YouTube videos, online sessions like what we have right now. We have Microsoft Learn for Microsoft Documents Reactor. And I know we missed the physical meetup, 
which is I do miss also, especially the conference. But let's not let's hope that the COVID will end soon. But um, what I mean is that just keep learning. So don't don't be afraid to explore. There's a lot of resources that's already available. And also, don't forget to share what you've learned. Anything you have is valuable to anyone. Even a, a simple step-by-step -step process, it's still worth, worthwhile to the other, the other users. Sometimes what you've shared, especially when you blog, for example, it could be a great resource, not for everyone, for, but for yourself. Because there's a times like if you have a problem in, in what you're doing, like for example, you're doing some codes and then you might stumble with the, uh, and then you're trying to find an answer in on the online, and then you stumble the solutions that you blog about sometimes. So I guess that's um, that's the best part about blogging. And also, yeah, you may never know that other also looking for the solutions that what you know that you shared it online as well. So sharing is scary. And also, I would like to say that this, um, be brave. This is this is one of my favorite movie. So I I like it. Uh, I'd watch it like multiple times already. So what I've learned is that be brave to explore and experience the unexpected. So forget about the traditional series. I mean, traditional is good, but sometimes it doesn't work out the way we want in this century. But Try to relearn or just continue learning, relearn, do it again. And yes, um, and also don't forget to be kind to one another and also to yourself. So thank you. Uh, for that, it's great. All right. Get back to you, Anna. All right. Thank you so much, Anne, for that great presentation. Um, really interesting to hear about your your journey. So, um, Anne will unfortunately not be able to uh, to join in later on uh, in the panel. So, thank you so much uh, for sharing your thoughts here with us uh, today. Um, and with that, we will head over to our next speaker uh, on the list. So, next up, I want to introduce uh, Priyanka Shah. So she is uh, also a Microsoft MVP within the area of AI. Uh, she has over 10 years of uh, experience in analysis, design and development, both in web and mobile development. She's a, a used speaker uh, at Microsoft and other technical events, talking about things like uh, ML.net, uh, conversational AI, bot framework, Azure Cognitive Services, speech to text, face recognition and a lot more. Uh, she has been working with uh, fund managers in data science and analytics with uh, Python, again, ML.net and the different web scra scraping tools, for example. Um, she's currently uh, leading innovation uh, and in an innovation technology team uh, with projects built on, for example, Elasticsearch, Bot Framework, text anal analytics, spam detection, uh, machine learning algorithms, and uh, again, much more. Um, she's a solution architect for microservices, which is very trending today uh, with uh, Azure Kubernetes clustering. Um, and she's also a very active blogger, um, especially on AI and, and machine learning topics. And she also has time to uh, join us today uh, to share uh, her journey in the industry. Really happy to uh, about that and uh, really excited to hear about your, your journey here up next, Priyanka. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Anna. That was quite a big introduction. <laughs> thank you so much. And uh, yeah, so today I'll be talking. Uh, just let me know if you can share my, I mean, you can see my screen. Uh, not yet. Yeah, just a second. It might be loading. Yeah, uh, share entire screen. Yes, share. Yep. So I think, is it OK now? Yes, so now I can yeah. see the presentation, like the PowerPoint right. is not in presentation mode. Yep, 
right uh, so today i'll be uh, you know quickly discussing about uh, my experience of onboarding the data science AI journey and along with it the myths which people generally uh, harbor about AI data science and few of the challenges which uh, the AI industry in general has been facing today right so which uh, could be like your geographical challenges could be uh, like you know humanitarian challenges so we'll just uh, quickly delve into that I'll promise you know we'll keep it as interesting as possible and I won't uh, drone on about uh, data science and AI and stuff but uh, the most important uh, so I won't uh, you know spend time here just one thing if you uh, want to connect with me you can find me on twitter fuzzy mind one right uh, so whenever uh, you know whenever we are looking at uh, artificial intelligence data science machine learning these terms are used very interchangeably and without you know uh, having any sense of uh, the problem which we are solving or the situation which we are dealing with right all right so even when people who come looking out for a career in data science so right now if you see the education field uh, in in the current um, uh, 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 current education scenario a lot of students a lot of uh, up and coming uh, you know people who are reskilling upskilling and in that early 20s or mid 20s or stuff and they are looking at this uh, field as the future so they are generally you know confused about uh, uh, what 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 should i take up so should i be a data scientist should i be an ai engineer should i be a ml engineer then what is uh, ml ops okay like we have devops and those sort of things and then is uh, you know if i am on the infra side or if i am on the uh, on the uh, system admin side then do, don't i have any scope for machine learning AI so a lot of lot of questions pop up and you know when we take up interns for our company for doing small summer projects and those stuff then these are some of the very pressing concerns and uh, huge gaps which I I you know I feel that even I myself when I came into this field so uh, I, I found that these gaps are unanswered or you know largely uh, mistaken one for the other all right so when you come when you when you look at ai it's it's like the super set so everything which you're trying to impart to a machine to to make the machine more smarter to make it you know solve a uh, human uh, give it human level cognition so that is basically imparting intelligence to a inanimate or you know to a, a very uh, i mean uh, to a non thinking non cognitive object which is artificial intelligence so just imparting so that becomes like the super set and how do we do that like how to enable that intelligence how to build that intelligence comes from uh, these two uh, broad fields which is data science and machine learning both of them you know are uh, huge humongous uh, in themselves and they have a lot of interdisciplines also which may or may not uh, deal with uh, uh, you know just imparting intelligence so could be just plain uh, data anal an analysis data cleansing uh, you know or uh, gathering data it also like that also forms a crux of uh, having a good solid machine learning algorithm to have a very diverse balanced and an inclusive data right so what happens when your data is not good will we quickly see those epic fails also so basically data science is just you know knowing what to do with the data so you have so much data around you in form of your social media in form of your uh, news channels your i mean there's data everywhere like you know you look around yourself and you're swimming in data right so organizations have annual reports and huge numbers and all those things so what to do with that data making sense of the data is there any hidden pattern is there any discernible stuff which i can unearth and then use for some sort of you know uh, uh, business intelligence making business decisions profitability so these are these fall within the purview of data scientists to make sense of all the data lying around us right and what do what to do with the data is basically harness the data to make some meaningful decisions okay so the scope of data science is mainly mainly business intelligence so what you know few uh, few uh, years ago we had uh, in i mean people who are well versed with uh, uh, ms sql we had the business uh, intelligence studio where you had all those uh, sql service analytics uh, SSAs, analytic services integration services so which you know which 
could help you view data in different dimensions like maybe uh, see years and uh, weather for i mean sorry uh, regional sales or yearly sales per region and those sort of data, data drilling down and then we had data mining data warehousing so all of these and much more is now combined into the field of data science okay so it could be i mean uh, the, the scope of data science is also for uh, predictive causal analytics which means you know some cause and effect so i have this this happened what is what could be the cause of uh, this happening again 10 years ahead in future something like that okay uh, now when we come to machine learning so data science we deal with the data now how to shape the data how to you know uh, mold the data into something which can make me uh, which can make sense which can give you meaning that is where comes machine learning right so you have data you gathered a lot of data from diverse sources you clean the data very well you you know remove the data which you felt was not a uh, uh, descript i mean which was not impacting your solution that much or it was not representative of your use case so you discarded the data so now you have a very nice clean huge data very uh, you know meaningful data now how to identify patterns within the data how to understand what the data is telling me and how to uh, have that you know data make uh, make sense like further down the line so i have like you know in my organization just to just to put it into perspective in my organization we have uh, earning uh, reports of uh, annual reports of companies or analysts comments about stock stocks of companies for let's say over 10 years right so now um, those uh, do those reports carry any sort of hidden sentiments like you know maybe if you look at the financial statements of financial reports of companies you will never find uh, a clear cut something like we faced a loss this quarter or our sales uh, plummeted by 60% this quarter never it's always glossed over you know so it's kind of uh, gold plating we call it so they'll always present it in a very euphemistic way saying that maybe this quarter uh, was a bit bleak as compared to the past ones but sales are surely looking up so now i have the data so this is my data machine learning what it will try to do is now it will try to analyze those sentences like okay it was a bit bleak but as compared to the past but it might look up in future so which means there's some sort of a negative uh, you know uh, connotation here and there's some sort of uh, a, 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 an implication that the sales are not as good in in the current so maybe the stocks are down and stuff like that now this is where machine learning comes so in machine learning you have various disciplines like computer vision is there you have um, natural language processing and and much more like you know cognitive decision making and stuff like that so basically that is what machine learning is going to give you a pattern you, you and you can have a lot of machine learning the scenarios like transfer learning reinforcement learning supervised learning and supervised learning but all of that all of the machine learning in the entire uh, you know ai universe which you talk about is nothing but plain statistics so basically all of for you who have uh, gone through the rigmarole of all our engineering algorithms where you learned the fourier transform and you learned um, eigen values vectors matrix multiplication determinants and stuff so just just you know understand that that all comes into play in <laughs> machine learning this is what machine learning brings to you and I, ai as i told you right it is nothing it's not you know it is not some a uh, futuristic looking robot which is going to dominate us it is simply put some intelligence which i'm imparting to an inanimate non thinking entity and making it think like a human at least trying to make it think like a human right it is easier said than done and uh, ai is you know machine learning uh, gives the data that meaning which will em uh, enable us to impart that sort of intelligence to the uh, to the machine and help it make decisions for us right so if you look at this difference between machine learning and ai if it is written in python it is probably machine learning if it is written in powerpoint it's probably an ai right so which means basically what what you're seeing in like your powerpoint auto completions or even in your powerpoint design ideas it's nothing it's just ai running in the background which is comprising of all the machine learning algorithms which have been designed in some of you know the uh, common popular coding languages available right and having said that you know 
know so there's a lot of glamour around these these things okay ah you data scientist it is it is not rocket science basically right it's just as i told you it's just mathematics statistics and what uh, we have been doing all all uh, all this time like people who have been doing data warehousing and were dealing with uh, uh, you know uh, data mining and stuff it's just uh, it's just got a fancy uh, uh, branding now so it's all machine learning and stuff like that but anyways is it the be all and end all absolutely not so you know if you if you see uh, these algorithms okay so ai algorithms like we talked about unsupervised learning and uh, reinforcement learning transfer learning okay and then you look at the mathematics which is available and if you try to combine those right not necessarily you are going to get, get a very coherent uh, uh, solution absolutely not I, okay and uh, uh, uh to uh, to you know uh, just just for us to understand like you know uh, for example there's ai all around us so you just look at your smartphones or your gmail when when the auto completion which goes on or uh, the face recognition services which are uh, you know commonly available with all the cloud solution providers image recognition where you just you know uh, snap an image and you can tag people on facebook and all that is nothing but all ai it's just that it is ai packaged as a service and given to us so routine only whatever we are doing like netflix recommendations when you are watching one particular movie and immediately you get recommendations like you watch this you watched a uh, people who watch this also watch this or uh, uh, same thing on amazon if you buy something this is nothing but you know ai just packaged as a service and given to you this is all ai which you are dealing with uh, commonly in your day to day life right and having said that having said you know like is it is it a big deal is it is it a big thing well absolutely not so for all we know all the uh, big three uh, you know giants which is microsoft google and uh, aws they all had their fair share of epic ai fails like uh, fails ai fails not you know, to the i mean uh, the size of like we can call it a blunder right so if you look at amazon recruitment ai it it could be you know in one word could be termed as a misogynist ai which means what they did was uh, see what is ai ai is basically the data which you feed it right so people who are feeding the data if they don't uh, have the data which is rich and diverse and you know uh, uh, inclusive and stuff like that not representative of all the diversity around you then absolutely the ai is going to make those decisions which are you know depending on the data which is fed to it so apparently the recruitment ai was supposed to you know pick out the choices resumes uh, in, and uh, re relieve the hr department of the headache of uh, the screening process the initial screening process but what it uh, actually did was every time you know one any job a uh, description was fed to that ai it invariably came up with a resume which was of a white you know uh, so westerner and male right so i mean in invariably as if you know there was no uh, talent there was a dearth of talent lacking uh, elsewhere so that was like one of the epic fails of amazon which your your data is not representative of uh, the diversity around you okay then uh, there was a microsoft initiative also where they designed the teenage bot which is called as stay so it was supposed to be like you know a conversational bot uh, and it would learn like it would learn as uh the more you interacted with it right and then there are spammers all around so people who interacted with the bot they spammed him and they fed him all the anti semitic and uh, uh, uh you know a nazi tweets and stuff like that and within 24 hours from being a very genial and a friendly bot it started speaking like i'm going to kill the entire human race and those those sort of things and then also you know you had ibm watson cancer detection and prescription ai which um, if you just look up the watson <laughs> cancer ai i'm sure you can find a lot of color full language they are used by doctors to describe it so those are some of the uh, you know epic fails which which is why you know now all these ai practitioners and ai providers they are uh, looking very deeply at the the concept of responsible ai or ethical ai right so which means it has it has to have these principles it should be inclusive like we saw otherwise you know you are representing only a set of the demographic or set of the Uh, population right then you should have fairness transparency 
accountability so anything goes wrong uh, with with you know with the inten- intended uh, solution or stuff you know who to i mean you know who to uh, uh, hold responsible for and you know the the next step of actions like you know now something like you know hey i just you know uh, set off the set of homicidal bots and now i don't know what to do it cannot be that so you need to have some uh, authority who is responsible for the actions of the algorithm you need to uh, be uh, i mean you need to feel reliable and safe and of course your pre- privacy and security should be uh, should should be you know uh, respected which is like a huge bone of contention with all the digital and uh, social media going around us but still i mean within the purview of these limitations uh, people are uh, the, the ai providers and cloud solution providers are trying to play by uh, these frameworks fairness is something like you know inclusiveness and fairness i just want to make a short point is inclusiveness and fairness differ in the the way that sometimes even if the solution is inclusive it won't be fair meaning if it is a loan approval system a loan approval algorithm invariably for students or for people who are uh, you know uh, lesser in age or just started out job the system would uh, would definitely you know uh, uh, be less prone to ac- approve their home loans and stuff so fairness means it has to be fair even uh, to a demographic or to the segment which is uh, not so wholly represented re- represented right so that is that is a subtle difference there okay and when we talk of responsible ai so of course like you know uh, ch- challenges in ai today are even though you know we harangue you a lot about uh, ai displacing humans and uh, bots taking over the world and stuff like that well it's not the case as of now because if you see uh, as a human right someone who very beautifully told me something that let's say i teach a robot to play chess right and he can beat like maybe the best in the world and it did like uh, the deep blue uh, algorithm or uh, ai algorithm it ap- absolutely it bet uh, gary kasparov right uh, but then can the same bot be taught to play tennis absolutely not or will it be as proficient in any other game no i have to impart intelligence to it i have to impart knowledge to that then only it would be able to do that right so say i mean th- that is what you know saying uh, ai is the be all and end all and you know is the end of uh, human human race and stuff is easier said than done because ai as we know today is capable of solving only one problem which is it it, it is the tailored for right so uh, that's why you know uh, 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 keeping these uh, these limitations in mind and keeping also the capability of the computing power which our algorithms bring to the table today uh, microsoft google amazon and lot of other uh, people in this uh, innovation space they are looking at uh, the add stuff like ai for good right which is ai for earth ai for community ai for preserving heritage for health for innovation and i would just on that note like to show you a very uh, you know nice use case for uh, for ai for good which is the ai for earth initiative you can see a lot of you know at microsoft innovation microsoft.com you can see a lot of these ai initiatives and so you see this ai for earth which is you know uh, uh, the a planetary computer okay so if you just look at that and you just click on one of the images which is available to you and then it will you know give you the species and the um, uh, hierarchy the animal kingdom the geography uh, i mean sorry the um, yeah uh, the what you can say mm. Uh, by biological naming convention of that animals and or what is their habitat are they endangered or not okay so these these are very useful for people or scientists to to label uh, endangered species to identify the habitats of endangered species and how to preserve them there are a lot of such initiatives okay you can go for you can just browse this site and you can uh, look at a lot of you know positive constructive use cases which uh, are which are being explored for ai okay all right and uh, yeah so again you know the another challenge which which uh, is is there in ai today is that not exposing our algorithms to more than what is needed for them like you might have uh, very uh, uh, famously the, the known of the very famous case of ai in uh, facebook where those two algorithms made a 
whole new language of themselves uh, between themselves and you know it was not uh, being able to decipher by the programmers who designed them so absolutely that is also one of uh, uh, the uh, challenges which we as ai engineers ml engineers data scientists need to keep in mind like uh, for example just teach the ai what is correct what is not don't impart it something else which is not needed right don't expose it to something else which is not needed okay so here you see that you know uh, the the robot is asking now can you hook me to the internet so that i can uh, self learn or whatever it is and another challenge in today which we see in ai is women representation in ai so if you you know just just as a joke so i was discussing with one of my um, Uh, recruiters hr recruiters about we wanted some uh, uh, females good strong data scientists to rep to have some hedging fund algorithms to design some hedging fund algorithms in our team and she said okay maybe you know if i search in google sophia the the female bot you know which uh, was designed uh, and i mean she was i think uh, she she famously said that she might kill the human race if she want, if she had to so that is that sophia ai bot is the only women uh, a woman available for AI. ai right now okay so yeah so ladies that is one uh, one serious uh, thing which we need to absolutely you know um uh, 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 battle against and have to reskill ourselves and you know have to have to uh, have to somehow balance this uh, skewed gender ratio which we have in uh, women representation in ai and all said and done uh, there was also you know very one of uh, my good um, researchers he is in seattle he is working as a data scientist in nasa then he said all said and done whether it's ai or ds or ml there is no substitute for common sense so <laughs> please keep that in mind and uh, yeah that brings me to the end of my uh, talk today on journey with ai All right. Thank you so much, uh, Priyanka. Um, really interesting talk. I, I really like this quote about uh, if it's written in Python, uh, it's probably machine learning. If it's written <laughs> in PowerPoint, it's probably uh, artificial yeah. intelligence. Very clear and, and easy to to remember. Um, right. Well, with that, it's uh, actually a time for our uh, panel discussion. So, yep. with that, yep. I want to introduce also our other uh, panelists. Um, so, while they are coming into the into the session and getting ready to answer some questions, um, just want to remind the audience that you guys can use the. Facebook chat, the YouTube chat, um, or comment section just to post your question there. You can also use the Slido um, uh, link to post your questions there as well. Um, if you have any questions to the one of the, the panelists or to all of the, the panelists. So just fire away with your questions. Um, and uh, Priyanka, while we're waiting for the other panelists to come into the Uh, to the session. Um, so, uh, from your perspective, what would you say are the most uh, important skills to train if you are interested in going into the data science uh, field and really want to excel in that area? Uh, so, there, are, like you know, for example, you need to know uh, your strengths. So, people who are working in SQL or uh, data-related stuff, they can look at data analytics. Like, like as I as I was saying, like you know, data ex exploration, data analysis, data warehousing, those sort of things. People who actually enjoy doing coding and uh, uh, you know exploring uh, 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 programming languages, they could go with uh, actually uh, the ML um, engineer uh, sort of role, where you know you can uh, uh, design Python algorithms and use a lot of Scala, Spark, clustering, and those sort of things. Uh, then also like you know ML ops, like uh, DevOps. ML ops is also an up and coming field where how to productionize your machine learning models, how to scale out all those uh, models on uh, cloud or on prem or any other environment so that is also a very huge uh, field in itself so people who are on the admin side or uh, infra side can also explore the ml ops uh, opportunity for them and of course you know data science is uh, anyone can jump in as long as you uh, you want to i mean you want to deal with mathematical concepts so 
people if you look at the, the core data scientist role in research in all these organizations ibm and google and amazon and all they are actually looking out for phd in mathematics so statistics forms the basis of all that so if you want to go in research uh, those sort of roles and otherwise you know if you are more of a programmer which is you have been working with the structured procedural languages c c sharp or c++ java those sort of things then of course you have this ai as a service uh, um, offering from Azure and from AWS. So AWS offers you SageMaker, and Azure offers you a lot of tools to work with that. So you can be that also. Like use, understand the concepts, but then don't write all those algorithms yourself. Use the AI as a service, and then uh, leverage it in your application via APIs or SDKs or whatever that is. Uh, so actually, it's it's a combination of lot of things depending on your forte and your uh, expertise. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's a good uh, good input. Uh, that it's like you know, depending on what your where you're coming from, what your where your interest lies, there are different aspects of data science that you can actually get get into, um, yeah. and the, which will of course require some different skill sets. Yeah. All right. Um, with that, I want to introduce uh, our next um, person, our next panelist here. Uh, so Samani uh, Palan uh, Palansoria. Um, she is an uh, IT profession uh, pr professional with more than 11 years of experience in the industry, um, living and working in Sri Lanka. Um, she is currently working as an associate technical uh, architect um, for 99X, uh, the well-known uh, company here in, in Sri Lanka. Um, she is also a Microsoft MVP and an active member in the Microsoft tech community, both as a speaker and as a mentor. So very nice to hear, have you here tonight, Samani. Um, and my qu first question to you is, um, uh, when did you be decide you wanted to become an, a Microsoft MVP? And why did you want to pursue that? Yeah, for me, uh, when I started uh, joining community work, uh, it's because when I started my career in IT, uh, I saw the industry was moving very fast and I wanted to join the community to make myself up to date. So I thought being actively engaged in the community is a good place where I can be actively engaged with these technical, highly technical people who where I can get the technical updates. After I get involved with these people, then I get passionate about doing sessions, sharing my knowledge where I saw the uh, inputs I get where I can validate my knowledge. And I saw the win-win situation where, where we get to get from this knowledge sharing. After I doing these things and having in this competitive market of IT, especially in this technical market, then I saw getting a title would make myself little uh, highlighted where I can prove myself. So then I worked towards getting MVP and somehow I managed to become the first female MVP in Sri Lanka. So I, I feel proud and I feel that I achieved it and I motivated few females to come in in Sri Lanka to get uh, awarded where uh, Hansa Mali and Pushpa came in. So I'm glad to have them also on board now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, that's uh, really great. And as I mentioned in the beginning, I think there's a huge value in uh, having uh, people who are, um, you know, like just leading the way, uh, showing that it can be done and insp inspiring other uh, females with with that. Um, you know, it's uh, since we uh, don't have um, as many uh, females as we have uh, male in, in this industry, it's really important that we have these like, visible, um, strong, strong characters that can can lead the way. Right, thank you so much, Samani, and we'll um, have more questions uh, for you um, uh, very soon. So next up, I want to introduce our next panelist, who is uh, Pushpa Herat. So she is a senior DevOps engineer with uh, more than four years uh, of experience in the industry. She is also a Microsoft MVP uh, within developer technologies. Um, she's an author of four books uh, already, a blogger and a lead of uh, the Sri Lankan uh, DevOps community. So I hope we have Pushpa um, with us here now in the call and in the session. We'll see if she will be popping up here. Uh, 
or should we go ahead with uh, Han Samali in the meantime while we're getting Pushpa into the so let's go with the Han Samali first. So uh, Han Samali, um, happy to have you here in the in the session. So Han Samali Gamagi is uh, an experienced professional in the uh, .NET stack and within Azure. She is again an MVP um, focused on Azure, um, a Microsoft certi and a Microsoft certified trainer. She's a, a frequent speaker um, at different tech events. Um, she is an award-winning writer uh, on the Microsoft of the tech, uh, TechNet Forum. And she also recently published a book on Azure functions with Cosmos DB. So, um, and also, uh, as mentioned, she's also been a, a vital part of actually organizing this event and getting it all uh, together. So Hans Amali, um, um, really um, impressive to see about your book uh, getting published. Um, so I'm curious to hear about how you went about getting this uh, this book uh, pu uh, published. Uh, yeah, Anna, thank you very much for the nice introduction. Uh, actually, when it comes to my book, uh, a publisher approached me and then I had to send an outline for the book so at first uh, the panel uh, the board uh, they didn't like my proposal so I had to write uh, another outline and send it again so it, it went for a few rounds and finally got the approval for the book outline actually at that time I was like three months pregnant with my baby uh, but I took the challenge because I was uh, looking for that opportunity for a while. Uh, then uh, sometimes I actually I had to spend my time to write uh, the book uh, when I was in my maternity leave also because for the uh, in order to catch the deadline because you know for a technical uh, book when uh, there are in the the time uh, the framework so the libraries that we are using in the tech stack it's getting changed rapidly so in order to align with the latest framework and libraries uh, that was uh, described in the book so I had to put some extra effort and I had to work hard uh, to publish the book so that was the journey about the book all right thank you so much um Right, so we'll check if we have uh, Pushpa um, available and ready to, to join the panel or if we'll... Uh, uh, Anna, I guess uh, Pushpa got some uh, problems with the uh, internet connection. So until uh, she joins, uh, we can continue. All right, so um, we will then um, continue with another question. We have gotten a question through, uh, through the chat. Um, uh, yeah, so this I think is uh, a bit targeted towards Priyanka. Um, uh, this is a question about uh, artificial intelligence. Um, could you tell any AI service that we can use? I have used TensorFlow so far for my ML pr uh, works and any advantage of using that service other than or uh, instead of uh, TensorFlow? Yeah, so so uh, see, TensorFlow is uh, like, you know, a, a, a library, right? When I say AI as a service, so which means you don't have to do anything. So probably you use TensorFlow, uh, PyTorch and Hugging Face for uh, sort of, uh, let's say, NLP uh, applications, right? When I say AI as a service, uh, you just go to Azure and you search, uh, see Azure Cognitive Services, right? So let's say I want to do sentiment analysis what what do you do sentiment analysis i as a as let's say i as a normal uh, software developer i don't know i just know that i need to give a sentence to that algorithm it has to give me a sentiment saying it is positive negative and it has to identify keywords key phrases some sort of uh, uh, I, entities like you know is it talking of some celebrities it is talking of some company well known company names those sort of things i don't want to build it I want to leverage uh, the services which are readily available. So uh, just look at cognitive services. There are a lot. There are face recognition services, text analytics services, uh, voice recognition, text translation, anomaly detection, all these, right? And they are ready, readily available to use as direct API. So just uh, create a resource on Azure and um, 
uh, create a cognitive search resource on azure and then just uh, they uh, these services are exposed as endpoints to you so you send the object in uh, uh, send request in uh, json get a re reply back in json format so that's it i mean that's you don't have to use any libraries any tensorflow any python any notebooks any you know those sort of things no need just use whatever they have given directly into your application plug it into your applications right and anyone can get started with those services right Absolutely. you're able to uh, sign up for an for an account for like a certain yeah. certain uh, like kind of usage it's uh, for uh, like free of charge you can play yeah. around you can um yeah um, test test around with it um yeah. without no cost for it yeah true Right, good uh, question. So this question came in through uh, slide, uh, Slido. Um, so uh, use that channel or use the, the chat channel in, in Facebook or if you're joining okay. through YouTube, you can also use that channel. Right, so then we have a question um, that is targeted towards uh, like all of our panelists. We can start with you, Priyanka. Yeah. Um, so what is the most significant uh, ad advice or the most important advice that you have received throughout your career? So I, I like I myself uh, have received, <laughs> yeah. Yes. So uh, it's uh, you know I have, yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. Uh, see, I I uh, have been fortunate enough to have a lot of good mentors. Like I I always had the people, uh, right people to guide me, good people to look up to, right. And I was interested in programming always. So one of I remember distinctly that one of my uh, tech leads he used to always tell me that don't be afraid to write beautiful code you know beautiful program don't be afraid and always believe in yourself like uh, because we used to be very worried that technology is changing so rapidly and you know at at such a, a huge pace uh, we will always need to play catch up with it so he was always like believe in yourself believe in yourself and as long as your foundations are uh, clear and the building blocks of what you are trying to base your knowledge on they are they are clear and they are uh, you know they, they are not you know a sort of uh, uh, hanging uh, by the thread then should be okay like you know you are you should be uh, all right because if you see of all these technologies as i said ai ml is all statistics maths programming languages is nothing but logic and a few uh, fundamental algorithms so as long as your basics are clear and you believe in yourself uh, don't afraid to you know just uh, go out there and face all the challenges uh, so that was that was something which uh, they instilled in me self belief and uh, the ability to you know look at problems in a way that you know this is this is my mount everest i have to i have to overcome it that sort of that sort of a positive attitude so that has mm -hmm. helped me a lot and uh, yeah that is how i you know usually when i undertake something new or i have to do something new learn something new this is how i usually uh, that attitude is what which i base my efforts on Mm -hmm. Right, good one. Uh, so next up, uh, Samani, uh, what good advice have you received during your career? Yeah, for me, as uh, she also mentioned, I was also lucky to have a lot of good mentors throughout my career. And one of the most uh, greatest advice that I have got through my career is uh, one of the uh, CTOs I have worked with has told me when you're learning something, uh, follow this rule what why when and how don't jump into how part when you're learning a technology if you do that you will never go up in your career that is means when you learn a technology learn first what this technology is then uh, what why this technology emerge when to use this then only learn how to use it when you go up in your career when you have to do the designing part when you go to work architect level when you go to the tech lead level these things are really really useful if you see the industry especially the ladies we see very less people in the architect level it's because we jump into this how level how part and we are missing this what why and uh, what part so i'm glad that i got this advice at the very beginning of my career so I all the knowledge that I gained through my career, I, I learned like that. And then that advice I have been given through my career, all the juniors I have. So that, that helped me a lot throughout my career when I'm learning all whatever I have learned so far. 
All right. Yeah, that's a really good, uh, really good advice. So first understanding why to use it, what it is, when to use it so that we can actually um, give input on, okay, so for this solution, yeah, this technology is actually going to help us solve the, the, the problem. Yes. Right. So next up we have Hansa Mali. So what good advice have you been given throughout your career? Uh, for me, it's like, uh, don't be afraid to try out new things. So don't, uh, don't feel like uh, uh, that if you write something, don't feel like uh, there will be no one looking at my article. If you start speaking in a meetup or in maybe in a small event inside your office, don't think that uh, you are very girly and you are, you have, you are very soft spoken. So something may not go correctly or you are not very good in uh, English so you can't speak English fluently since uh, in Sri Lanka we most of us are like uh, had our uh, primary education uh, in Sinhala medium so don't be afraid to try out the things that you like so don't feel disheartened that uh, when when you when you have written a blog post or maybe an article, uh, it hasn't co got to the the number of uh, audience that you have expected. Don't get discouraged or disheartened. You can try uh, with with the experience that that your failure in the next time. So that's the kind of uh, the best advice I have got from the mentors I had. Yeah. Very good one. Uh, and next up, we have a question from uh, um, from the audience from the chat channel here. So this is also a question for uh, for everyone to to answer. Let's start with you, Priyanka. Um, how do you balance your employ uh, employment uh, obligations with the community work? Uh, yeah, so it's it's a very you know good question, and uh, see, there's no easy answer to this. It's always a tightrope uh, walk, right? Um, the only only good part I see is because my routine work also involves the same thing which I do in community as well. So I mean, I blog and talk about AI, and that is uh, most of most of the examples or sessions which I present are actual real life business problems which we have been facing or we've been trying to solve. Uh, so th that's that's you know a bit lucky part like i'm i i'm doing a i mean i'm representing ai and i'm working uh uh, in AI, uh, so so that is uh, that helps uh, me a bit. Uh, but apart from that, uh, you you have to uh, in I mean in your office front, you have to learn to say no to some things which you know which might uh, prevent you from com uh, contributing to your hobbies or to your community activities and stuff like that. Uh, but yeah, I mean uh, absolutely, like uh, it, it it's abs uh, it no no uh, one answer for that or no correct answer for this. So uh, sometimes your family time suffers because you've got community activities and you've got uh, uh, your office act i mean of your office uh, uh, re requirements formalities to complete so yeah i mean uh, <laughs> it's uh, a tough one to answer but uh, you i mean see if you have the passion and if you have uh, the uh, leaning towards to to uh, make time for all these things and i think you will you will however like for example if you want to go for a uh, hiking at 7 a.m in the morning or for uh, you know a nice trip field outing then no matter what how tired you are or how late you slept last night you will still you know try to get up and be enthusiastic and uh, be on your way so i think it's the same thing like at the end of the day uh, it's a passion that matters and how really you want to contribute towards the community all right uh, good th thoughts thank you um so samani what are your thoughts on this balancing the community work with your other obligations yeah i think it's somewhat very similar to what uh, priyanka mentioned it's about the uh, passion and it's about to understanding the win-win situation we have here. So as much as you uh, contribute to the community, you learn as much as there as well. So I spend the time that I have to spend on my competency building to contribute to the community. So when I'm doing a session, I learn by myself as well. So the time I spend contributing to the community means I'm learning for myself as well. So it's not an extra time that I'm spending to community. It's I'm spending to community. It's spending my to myself as well. So it's it's a win-win situation. 
So having a passion and thinking it's a win-win situation, it's, it's becomes effortless. <laughs> mm. Yeah, good, uh, good thought. Like rem rem remembering that it's also about your own personal development, your own professional development, as well as sharing and com uh, contributing to others. Yes. Right, and uh, Hansa Mali. Um, so, how are you thinking in this this question, balancing the different obligations? Uh, yeah, as uh, Sammani and Priyanka told me, like it's it's we don't have like a perfect formula for that, but uh, somehow I try to follow like uh, my first priority is family, uh, then my work. That's what I'm getting paid from, uh, and the third one is uh, time for myself to do what I like. Uh, maybe it can be watching. Uh, a new TV series or a drama, uh, but that can be so. If you are a tech enthusiastic person, and if you uh, so, uh, if you are a tech person and you want to persist in the IT industry, you have to do some homework by your own without uh, apart from the uh, office hours, the usual eight to five office hours. So, if you are uh, like to uh, write articles, if you like to uh, speak. Uh, in front of the audience and travel into uh, different places and uh, to uh, communicate with the other speakers in different regions and countries so is that if if that's the passion inside you so you can follow that path if you if you have a target i want to have i want to author a book or i want to uh, create an article and I want to submit that for a, a competition that's uh, maybe going on with Microsoft or maybe in another platform so you can have that target and you can uh, work towards that even though it's uh, difficult for us while balancing everything uh, especially in this uh, time period when we, you are working from home uh, I guess it's a bit difficult rather than uh, going out to the office but uh, you have to balance everything and if, if you are uh, so as the Priyanka told if you if you want to go for a hiking and you want to wake up at 7am in the morning out in the cold so if you have that enthusiasm for uh, to go for the hike uh, if you have a target I think uh, you can work towards that a little by little all right good thoughts Right, so we have some more questions from the chat. Uh, so we'll take uh, two questions together because they are quite uh, linked. Uh, so we will start with Priyanka. Um, so the question is about, do you think enough is done today uh, to help women to get into the tech industry? And as a follow-up question on that as well, what can we do as of now to, um, to promote uh, tech industry even more to uh, girls and, and females? Yeah, yeah. Just, uh, thank, thank you, whoever asked this question. You know, it's it's a real um, pressing need of the uh, current situations and uh, uh, the times which we live in right now. So, uh, it, to answer the first question, do you think enough is done to you know help women get into tech industry? Absolutely no. Uh, from from my personal experience, there are a lot of times where they want to have uh, women leaders on board or you know women architects on board, but that is most of the time just to Check, check a tick box that I had a diversity higher, I had a, you know, a women in leadership higher. And um, that, that is like, you know, and after that, I mean, once you're, uh, it's it's kind of a target, once it is checked, once that check, check box is checked, then all that uh, women in leadership and all goes for a toss and then you know, you are not basically whatever empowered person you got on board uh, with you for the, uh, I mean, uh, on the, uh, I mean, uh, for whatever you import female you got uh, on board with your company and th that the the entire uh, uh, this is lost the benefit is lost right and um, i mean also like for example you know a lot of women as they uh, grow into their careers most of them i think are encouraged to go more towards uh, management roles like hey why not be a project manager hey you know maybe just promote her to that uh, uh, management side or make her and go to the client facing side and stuff like that and I think a lot of them are discouraged to grow technically or, you know, maybe they are scared saying you might have to work shifts or you might have to sit late for deployments or if there are production issues and stuff like that. So which kind of deters uh, women from entering into the tech field or growing into the tech field. But I think 
none of the workplaces or very few of the workplaces create that kind of conducive environment wherein you know let's not have unrealistic deadlines let's not have deliveries running into production deliveries running into overnights and weekends and stuff like that right and then even if they do do not single out women in your team for uh, not ab- able to fulfill those kind of unrealistic uh, and unhealthy working habits right i mean because they are i mean don't make them uh, a sacrificial lamb of the wrong working system uh, work uh, ethics in place in the uh, environment right so that is one thing which i very strongly uh, adhere to and which i st- i am very opinionated about right and as of now uh, what can we do to promote uh, tech industry among women girls is like make them aware of uh, the tech challenges so as uh, we uh, i mean in my workplace we take a lot of interns and we make sure to orient them technically so a lot of uh, girls which i come across and especially you know for example women uh, anjo was saying women who code and she loves tech and those sort of coding forums technology forums i think we need strong women voices to advocate this sort of uh, women in technology women who code uh, women in you know uh, leadership uh, sort of a uh, sort of stuff because i have come across a lot of uh, female programmers female techies who really wanted to be in this field but either you know they were discouraged by uh, the pace of uh, fast changing technology or they are discouraged by several other factors like the ones which i mentioned right uh, so one thing is obviously having a very supportive conducive uh, environment in your workplace and second is you even as females yourselves try to have a uh, you know healthy support system to your fellow females for your fe- fellow female um, co- colleagues also encourage them uh, mentor them uh, seek advice from them if they are your seniors that sort of sort of a thing so that's also like you know personally also the onus is on you to empower your fellow girls females Yeah, uh, really good points and I I really like the fact that you brought up about like companies and employers actually also has a big responsibility here in making sure that we're having like healthy good uh, work hours and and work times that like even though it might uh, like have it has been a bit of a standard in the the industry to have like you know um, really late nights working all nights um tending to uh, support yeah. issues like regardless of when it is said uh, during the week uh, you know we have a responsibility of making sure that like no that should not be the norm and not the standard and everyone like female and male should be able to have a working family life together with a good yeah. career in, in IT Right, really good good points. Um uh, next up Samani, how uh, what are you thinking about these two questions? Yeah, for me it's like uh, 50-50. Uh, I agree and uh, <laughs> not agree. Uh I think it's it's our responsibility as well. So I think uh, now most of the companies are working towards creating this culture. of uh, having a work balance life within it companies i think it's not only for the females it's required for the male as well having a proper work life balance because we are working towards a modern life we are only not only the females working on home front we need male also to help us because most of the females are working mothers now so only the males females cannot uh, look after the home front now so it's it's a responsibility of the management of uh, it uh, industry that they provide proper working culture within the companies for both male and female to have a proper healthy working hours so they have a proper healthy working hours and it's a it's a responsibility of the employees as well when they are working they have a healthy professional ethics that they work properly i see some some people start late and work late so it's their professional ethical problem so if they want to have a proper eth- ethical work life balance they have to start on a proper time and end their work on a proper time some people start around uh, 11 am and work till 9 10 so then they don't balance their work life balance so it's it's a it's a, it's a professional way of handling things so it's a it's a balance between the employer and the employee and i think the other thing is as females when we have female colleagues in the team 
as priyanka mentioned we always have to see though we always talk about this gender equality and all we have to accept this fact still in asia we don't have this 100% equality in asian countries we still the asian countries ladies take the most of the home front work so we have to give them an extra support when we assign work to them and we have to see that they are taking a lot of work and extra effort so when when we go into the leadership level the females we have to encourage the junior female developers the engineers encourage them give them support uh, to get them uh, to grow up in their career so for me it's a the responsibility of the employer and the employee as well so i think we have to take the responsibility of both the ends and make this industry a female friendly one yeah very good uh, points so last up we have uh, hansa mali what are you thinking regarding these two questions uh yeah and i actually as uh, sammani and priyanka mentioned yes we want to encourage and uh, help help and support uh, more females uh, girls into the tech industry uh, we can start that from the university level since uh, when i was following my degree in my batch it was like more more girls were uh, cornered into the uh, uh, they should follow ba path or maybe they should follow qa path with out coming into coding coding path to be a engineer because of uh, that uh, girls are fear of uh, working on working in the code or maybe just they are like uh, when we are forming the project uh, assignment groups as well so uh, the the boys uh, tend to select two or uh, three girls for the for their team because to just to create the documentation or to create the powerpoint slides and to do a nice presentation the boys will handle the uh, coding part or maybe the project uh, they are developing but the girls uh, they thought like girls uh, don't have the talent or don't have the uh, knowledge to uh, work on a uh, a coding system or maybe a project so that was the mentality in most of the uh, youngsters uh, have so i think if we can break that barrier in the university level it there's there's nothing like that it's just a, a myth that uh, the boy can uh, follow uh, uh, the coding side job to be an engineer to be a cto architect and women girls don't have uh, that kind of a facility even though we have some uh, extra uh, extra like things that we have to do in the home front but i think women uh, girls are like they are multitaskers that's that's why uh, a mother can give a birth to a child to uh, to give a birth to another living species so i think uh, so we have to encourage that from the university level then they when they enter into the industry uh, when we have junior developers interns female uh, females we have to encourage them to uh, go through the path they want not uh, after like having uh, four five years of experience now i have i am married and i have kids so i want to go for another path like pa or maybe a qa level since i can't follow the uh, the technical trends latest technologies uh, around the industry so that's not the the thing that that's not the uh, the thing we have to encourage them and we have to support uh, with our experiences right good points there um right so um um you guys the ch the chat channel the um uh, those channels are still up so you can still ask more questions if you uh, have some more questions for the for the panel um so um priyanka um i was uh, um you know i think it's a really interesting topic that you were discussing about and that you are working with when it comes to uh, like equality and working for equality within like when we're working with ai and machine learning it's a bit tricky because what we're doing what we're feeding the like the algorithms with is of course um historical data and as we know the historical data is based on a even more unequal world than what we're living 
living in today. So do you have some examples of like, you know, how um, you talked about this like ethical way of working with AI? Uh, how uh, do you see that, uh, um, you, you know, that people are working with like either, uh, I don't know, adjusting the data or uh, adjusting the algorithms or uh, how, what do you do to actually make sure that the, the AI and the machine learnings won't just be like reproducing these like bias that we have from the from the past uh, see uh, this is bias right uh, you have to for example there are a lot of frameworks that are coming up so there's something called as a fair learn framework which helps to offset this bias or there are a lot of uh, machine learning tech algorithms like SMOT, SMOT, which we call it, uh, to help uh, balance out these sort of, uh, 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 you know, data imbalances, like your data set might be leaning towards a particular set of demographic or represent one set of population more heavily as compared to the others. So in that case, you have sort of, uh, you know, technologies and tools available to uh, offset these uh, inherent bias in the data. Uh, again, there's something which is called as a data drift. Uh, we take uh, this a terminology called as data drift, in which uh, because you know you had data for ten years, and then maybe in the next uh, one or two years, the the shape of the data or the uh, the uh, what the data is trying to tell you the story might change. Like you know, for example, now we didn't know about this pandemic and what it would entail. Like a lot of businesses, they might have uh, done stupendously well uh, uh, pre-pandemic and now post-pandemic, like Airbnb for that matter classic example and then suffered the uh, you know, tremendous losses uh, then so maybe you know th so this data drift is something which we take into account wherein the landscape of the data it keeps on changing and then those adjustments you keep on doing uh, you need to keep on doing to your algorithm so there are a lot of parameters uh, which we call which 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 we just uh, which data scientists you know call as hyperparameter tuning so there are a lot of uh, uh, terminologies like uh, 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 optimization uh, rates, learning rates, or um, loss uh, parameters to adjust them to so that you know you can adjust your uh, the the, the uh, data the th change in data is accounted for. Uh, but that said and done, these are one some of the few things which, uh, as you know, as we have learned from our past mistakes and from the uh, inherently incapable. Uh, I mean, uh, inherently. Um, uh, wrong way that you know sometimes data can lead us to or uh, point us to so we have uh, these are the things which we have learned from our mistakes and we are trying to put these into place so there's nothing uh, to you know foolproof that you will say that okay after i implement these things uh, my solution is foolproof and it is uh, not you know going to fail absolutely not so this is something which we need to keep on doing very consciously following the ethical frameworks following the uh, uh, applying the uh, fair learn uh, uh, principles you know so that we at least uh, for uh, the the solution we are developing we are not overstepping boundaries or we are uh, not uh, uh, you know being in troubled waters uh, apart from that you know as data grows as computation power grows as our own uh, understanding of machine grows this uh, these things are about to change you know these things uh, will change and we'll might have more comprehensive understanding in future uh, but right now we make do with whatever we have we try to make uh, the best of it all right um, right, and so one more question uh, from the from the uh, audience here. Uh, so Yusra is asking, and this one we'll take with uh, Samani to start with. Um, in your opinion, uh, what are the advantages of having women in the tech track? So Samani, uh, interested to hear your thoughts on this question. Yeah, so we'll uh, look at uh, what we look at having uh, engineer what are the qualities we look at of an engineer so one thing is being able to uh, uh, work in multiple aspects like getting up to date adoptability context switching uh, having a lot of good uh, soft skills team skills so all these things normally with the feminine genes we have because females are normally gifted with these skill sets. So when we manage the home front, we do all these things. 
So having females in the tech industry as they naturally have the skill set, they can do magics if they come to the tech industry. So we really, really need more, more and more females coming into this industry because you females are more loyal and uh, are more persistent in this industry. So we really need more females to come into this industry. So we really want to work. The sad thing is even the females come into industry after a few years, we see they track, change the track. Please don't do that. Stay in the track of tech. Uh, don't change the track. We need more and more females to stay in this track because you all have all the, all the skill set that is needed by the tech stack. Right, good, uh, good thoughts there. So, Hansa Mali, um, what are you thinking about this question? Uh, yeah, Anna. Uh, advantages of having in uh, having women in tech track means if, if we allow or if we support and help the uh, the girls or ladies to stay in the tech stack or maybe start their uh, jobs uh, in engineering in uh, in coding, so that means uh, we are helping to succeed in their dreams, right? So we can support and uh, uh, share our experience with them uh, being in the tech industry so sometimes uh, in the younger generation we can find sometimes uh, a girl is uh, thinking of forming her own company uh, and starting her own company in Sri Lanka and they, so there can be such kind of dreams like that so in uh, Sri Lanka as well as in the uh, across the world we, we, we can see that uh, it's the IT or the tech industry is a male dominant industry but uh, little by little with small steps we will be able to uh, support and help and guide the younger generation to start their careers in uh, tech stack yeah very true and not missing out on the potential that these uh, uh, female engineers actually come and like bring to the to the industry right so the time is uh, um, starting to uh, to run out um if we have any last question we will take that um otherwise i would like to be, uh, give a big thank you to our uh, panelists and to our speakers for today's session um i hope that you guys in the audience have enjoyed this session if you have any thoughts and suggestions on what kind of topics that you would like to uh, hear about in upcoming sessions uh, do please engage with the women in tech sri lanka forum uh, either in Facebook or uh, yeah, in the meetup group or anywhere um, and just uh, share your thoughts about like what would be interesting for you guys to, to hear about or get inspiration about uh, going forward. Um, and we can see if we can make that happen. Um, if you have suggestions also on uh, interesting people uh, that you would like to hear uh, more from, uh, people that you know from the industry, um, give us uh, tips about those and we will try to reach out and see if we can get them into a session. Yeah, but so with that, that uh, I want to thank you guys all, uh, both the audience and the speakers, the panelists, and of course the organizers of this event uh, today, tonight, um, and wish you all a really nice continued evening and week, and hope you uh, that we will see each other in the next uh, Women in Tech meetup um, uh, in uh, next month. Thank you very much, and. Uh, See you uh, all uh, hopefully very soon.